Listeners, welcome back to the Black Muse, the hub for all Black culture and entertainment discourse. Quick introduction, my name is David Houston, and I'm going to be uh, your gracious host for today. But even more exciting is the guest that we have, we're going to be speaking with today. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Miss Barbara Bates. Uh, she is a fashion mogul, Chicago native, and entrepreneur. Uh, Ms. Bates is dressed and designed for some of the most world's famous fashionistas, influential figures, community leaders, and celeb clients, as well as util utilizing her uh, talents to give back to the community. So without further ado, Ms. Barbara Bates, how are you doing today? Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate you having me. It's an honor. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, if you're ready to go, let's just jump right into it. Okay. Um, as a Chicago native, uh, you grew up in Chicago, went to school out here. Uh, why don't we tap into a little bit of your background and tell me a little bit about growing up here and, um, you know, what, what life was like, you know, being on the West Side and kind of navigating Chicago um, during that time. Okay. So, right, I grew up on the West Side of Chicago. I attended uh, Chicago Public Schools. I graduated from Marshall High School. And in the interim of uh, graduating from Marshall High School, I, uh, I took a brief year uh from Marshall and I went to an alternative school because I became a teen mom. And so the school now is called Simpson. At that time it was called Family Living Center and there was only one in the city of Chicago. So my counselor uh, made it happen for me to be able to go to that school and not have to miss out you know, on missing school credits since I was gonna be a teen mom. And uh, going to that school enabled me to come back to my high school, Marshall, and uh, had acquired extra credits. So I was able to actually graduate a year earlier than my class, uh, you know, with a, with a child sitting in the audience with my mom. After I left high school, I, um, I knew that I wanted to go into fashion, but um, I wanted to take like a shortcut road. And so fashion was sort of like still set on the back burner but I would always like uh, design my own clothes. I had friends who knew how to sew and I would design them, they would sew them and I would wear them to my nine to five job. And in wearing them to the nine to five job, people started asking me, wow, where did you get that from? And I would say, I designed it. And um, that's kind of how my design career started. It actually started um, with me wearing my designs that other people had sewn for me and selling them to girlfriends and to people that I worked with. Why don't you tell me a little bit about um that early inspiration, like I, looking at, you know, um, fashion and clothes during like the 80s and 90s, you know, you're dealing with a lot of colors, a lot of patterns, um, sometimes different types of baggy fittedness on clothing and, and things of that nature. So what kind of inspi inspired you um, in your designs, like kind of in your early stages of getting things together? So actually I'm a self-taught fashion designer. I did not go to school for fashion design and everything that I learned about like fabrics and fabrications, I just learned um, just from, you know, liking what I liked, feeling the fabrics, getting uh, to know the fabrics, getting to know what they could do. So I always had like a really strong hand on what a fabric could become. I could just see a swatch and I knew like the movement of what it could be. And so that was like something that was just innate that allowed me to have a little upper hand on other people that were designing in the city. The other thing that gave me an upper hand is that I came from a family, uh, my mom and her two sisters were very well-dressed women. So I saw beautiful fashion as I was growing up. So when I decided to start design, I started to go into it on the high end. A lot of people now, you know, they call themselves designers and they are in their own right. And they do t-shirts and sweatshirts and socks, but I went straight in and I wanted to do leather and suede and exotic skins, crocodiles, pythons, high-end, um, you know, fabrics, and, and that's, that's just what, like where I started my business, doing things that were high end. And one of the other reasons I started doing high end is because I was a shopper myself. I love to shop, but I didn't mm -hmm. have the budget to go to shop at the stores that I was going to. And I would wonder when I would go to these stores and see things, why does it cost so much? Why am I gravitating toward the things 
that have such a high price tag on them. And so those are things that I study. And a lot of it was because of where it was made and how it was made, you know, what it was made from. So okay. I knew I wanted like a top end garment. I knew I wanted to compete with people who were doing, you know, designer clothing. And so, you know, wearing things, you know, wearing my own designs, um, you know, women would ask me about, you know, where I got them from. And then I would say I designed it. I had friends in high school who knew how to sew. And so they would sew for me. And I just, since I really didn't know pattern making, what I would do is I would make simple things out of exotic fabrics. So it may have just been a plain, simple skirt, but the skirt would have been out of a textured piece of fabric. And then right away, one of my first loves was going into leather because leather was really strong during the 70s, 70s and the 80s. And, um, and one of the people that I competed with was a huge um, store called North Beach Leather. But the thing about North Beach Leather is that they did, you know, hundreds and hundreds. They were manufacturing. The thing about Barbara Bates is that she was doing custom. So if you were going to spend a lot of money on something, you were going to be the only one with it. You could come to me, you can get a custom design, and you can get something that make people turn their heads and say, oh, wow, where'd you get that from? So in the 70s, there was, um, you know, the 70s was, uh, was not really the era that I was designing and selling. It was like more of my era, but the 80s, my business started in 1986. Mm -hmm. And um, and I started, it was, you know, the big padded shoulders. It was the long duster coats. Um, Versace was a big designer. So it was lots of colors and patterns. People wanted to mimic that. Um, it was still like the jersey fitted things. Donna Karen was one of the huge designers that was in New York that was really doing her thing at that time. And so people, my friends that were coming to me or people that were coming to me, they were looking for that, that high-end style, but they didn't necessarily want to spend, you know, $2,000 on a jacket. Right. But can right. you give me something that looks like that looks like that. And so the inspiration from that was what was given to me when people started coming to me for custom clothing. Do you, do you feel that kind of like there is this um, relationship of inspiration that uh, kind of um, goes in between the two industries of fashion as well as music or any other type of creative industry? Um, and like, what, what does that kind of mean to you and, and, your, and you coming up and uh, having all the accolades that you've done? Most definitely, the two definitely collide and they work together, the music industry with the fashion industry. A lot of times people will see someone on television and because they're seeing a celebrity or someone that they admire and, and that person is wearing something unusual, just the mention of that designer's name or just that look on that person that may be different, it gets people to wondering like where that came from. And the designer can sometimes become an instant hit from one particular person wearing something that they've done. So there's definitely that, that mix together. Also for a designer that's doing everyday wear, an entertainer or someone who's in the music industry can come to you. And that's where you get to show who you are. When you're doing custom, sometimes you're doing what the people want. When you get a chance to show who you are or you're working for an entertainer you can put your thoughts you can put all of you into what that piece is and you know maybe they're not directing you how to go down the road so it's like a true uh, piece from you um, I was really blessed in the 80s that I was able to work with you know a lot of people in the music industry some names are known now some names have gone like cool Modi was someone that I dressed I did all of his leather for him so the little koofy hats and the leather that he wore that was like a signature piece that he had on um, I worked with Snoop Dogg like in the 80s and you know, his look was just so wild. I didn't even want anybody to know that it was mine. So I wouldn't put my name <laughs> inside of the labels of his, of his clothing because he was hanging with a guy from the west side of Chicago called Bishop Juan. And they made, the things that I made for them, I made them at night when nobody could see me. Right. <laughs> crazy stuff they were making but there are, there are some people that can come to you you know and, and they allow you to just put your true self into what that particular piece is and then other people are coming to you and you got to make it because it's going to make money for you you're in a new business you're an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and you're going to do you know like what it takes you know being legal to get the payroll done you know and just to keep the business you know rolling so a lot of times you know being a designer is not all the glitz and glamour that you see sure. not especially if you're a business person if you're an entrepreneur that's trying to grow a business and to take care of everybody that's working for you to keep that business moving another question that i i uh, often wonder about specifically about the the fashion world do you think that um what becomes popular in fashion has to do more of the region of where it, it comes from or do, do you think it has to be like it doesn't really matter where it comes from it just has to do with that particular trend i think i think there's i think both both of those both of those things come into play there's no special rule for fashion especially right, right. now today you know in the 21st mm -hmm. century there is no rule 
There's, you know, people talk about fashion trends. For me, there are no trends. It's very difficult for me to take, you know, what, what's the color palette gonna be? You know, I'm, I'm reading it from somebody that's over in Paris and I'm sitting over here in Chicago in the inner city. And why would I wanna take powder blue and put it on somebody who doesn't, you know, who's always still wearing navy blue. So it, the two, you know, it just, it's, it's all over the place. I don't like to just like, you know, take myself and put myself into a box. And I don't like to put my designs in a box or my customers in a box. And that's why normally I buy fabric first and then I design from the fabric. I design, mm -hmm. the fabric is able to give me the inspiration that I need to figure out what it will become. Sometimes it's spot, you know, spot on, it's good. Sometimes it's like a little bit of a harder sale. But, you know, because, you know, I'm creating it and I have the control of it, you know, I can tweak it to be, you know, what someone else big is doing. I can make, I can make it look similar to theirs or I can just give you easy, you know, what you want. So it's, it's fashion is just like all over the place. There's no one road to walk down. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that, um, especially when uh, you have to do with like repeating trends or, you know, or I, as I like to call it, history repeating itself. I mean, you always. And that's where we are that. right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're, the, we're, mm -hmm. we're absolutely there right now. So yeah, we are totally. so, I mean, you know, growing up, I would always hear people say, you know, fashion always comes back around. But, you know, as a 20 or 30 year old, I don't know what was going on 20 or 30 years ago. So it didn't mean a whole lot. But mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. in my 60s, I can look back, you know, 30 years. This is my 35th like, this year. Is what <laughs> and I can. <laughs> <laughs> And I see it. I mean, I see every single thing. And it's difficult sometimes for me to do some of the things that I've already mm. seen, because to me, it's not fresh. And so I have right. to, you know, I have to get like tapped on the shoulder by somebody else to say, oh, no, look, this is what they're doing. Now, most of what has come back around again is not necessarily my generation wearing it. It's more your generation wearing it. like a bomber jacket was something that you know, I refuse to go back to bomber jackets were huge when I first started out. I mean, I was the queen of bomber jackets yeah. because yeah. I gave them to you in unusual things. I did them in leather, patchwork leather. I did them in the tile jackets that were so famous back in that time. I mean, all those things I was doing to see a bomber jacket come back again. I'm like, whoa, or to see big shoulder pads come back or to see like wide leg jeans come back again. All those are things that are really, really popular right now that you know i lived it and some of it i will never wear again it's just like i'm not going to do it so i could let the 30 20 year olds they can wear it uh, but some things have come back again and you can put a fresh twist on it and you can update it you know like a, a bell bottom could be a wonderful fit and flare pant now you know that's mm -hmm. a look that was really huge back in the day but it's made a huge comeback today Those, you know some things i can live with and some i'm just like oh no i'm not i'm not doing that again right, i'm not gonna right. wear big shoulder pads again i'm not doing it it could be popular for you for this particular. <laughs> I'll place. make it for you. I'll, make it. I'll, I'll sell it to you, but it, I'll make it up, but it won't be hanging on the rack as a ready. Fair enough. Me. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's awesome. Um, another thing that I kind of wanted to ask you about too, um, that we touched on was uh, fashion and technology. Um, do you think it's been you know helpful, detrimental? Is it uh, is it, has it actually helped the process of making clothing? What what do you have to kind of talk to about that? So actually, I'm totally lost on technology. If we were to get any kind of little glitch right now, I have to call somebody to come over and turn up the volume or turn it down. So I'm so like lost and left behind, but I'm slowly just trying to go in. In terms of the technology, for me, the technology is great when it comes to going online and going to, I need to go to one of my fabric stores in New York. I can't be there in New York, so let's go to right. the website. So that is like amazing. Like the tools that fashion designers have at their fingertips today is just incredible. That was not available for me 35 years ago. It was like beating the pavement. It was going to the Rolodex trying to find, you know, uh, you know, a company that had the word fabric or leather in it. So it was super, super, super difficult. With technology today, it's amazing. You can actually jump online and, you know, say that you want a pattern for a pair of skinny pants and a PDF will come up and you can print that baby off. None of those things were available. So I think yeah. that, um, you know, today is just amazing what, you know, what could be done with fashion, especially you can, you can even take a, a silhouette and you can pop in different patterns. You know, I had to sit with a coloring crayon or, you know, right. just right. imagine it in my head. So like some of those things I, I won't, some of those things I'm not gonna say I won't, but I have not taken advantage of because I'm a feely touchy kind of person. I'm not even a big online shopper for, I mean, I'll, I'll shop online for clothing, but I still love going into the stores, mm -hmm. touching my fabric, feeling my fabric, having a relationship with the fabric, you know, for the next stage. 
do you use when you are doing designs do you still use like pen and pad or do you uh use like you know any adobe software or like like i know they have the stylus the different type of stylus and pad, like ipads and stuff like that or do you try what to talk about real what you talking about willis i don't know nothing about all that i'm using a pen <laughs> and some paper and i love scribble scrabbling and sketching it and just let it sit there put it to the side bring it back again I'll, I'll jump online and go to Pinterest for inspiration and start my own Pinterest boards and go back and forth. Or I'll take a picture of something so that it'll stay fresh in my mind. And then, you know, I have to look at it for like a week or a couple of weeks to see, do I want to continue on with trying to, you know, make something happen with this? And then after that, I'm going to go look for fabric and then I'm going to just tell the fabric what, what it can be. So always go back again to, I need the fabric in front of me first to go mm. on to the next stage. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you for, you know, giving me a little deep dive into your brain about how, you know, your process goes. This is, this is great. Um, so I know we talked about uh, you were had a full time job and then you uh, were, you know, kind of like selling your clothes on the side. You were um, modeling your own clothes, going to work and people were asking about it. So around 1988, if I'm correct, that's when you 86. kind of actually started. Your 86. OK, sorry about that. So at 1986 is when you started your um, your business. So kind of talk to me a little bit about that process about how your like hobby side hustle actually got off the ground to become like a full fledged business where you were like, okay, this is what I'm doing full time. So I'm working I'm working a full time job at a huge company, First Chicago Bank, which is now called Chase. I'm mm -hmm. wearing my designs to work. I got girls coming by my desk every other day, introducing themselves to me, saying, "We saw you on the elevator. Oh, you dress so <laughs> nice. Oh, you know, we were somebody was talking about the girl, on the <laughs> yeah, all that kind of stuff." So you know, my entrepreneurship. The first thing I said was, "Well, I can make one for you." And they were like, "Really? You made this?" And I was like, "Well, I designed it." And so I said, "You know, you can meet me in the bathroom at break time." And that's how my business first started in the bathroom, break time, you know, taking measurements and then meeting them on the 15th and the 31st. And I'm sure, you know, those are the paydays mm -hmm. in corporate America. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, that's all I was concerned about was pay, are you going to pay me when I give you this garment? Right. And so, uh, and so but by them wearing my designs, it was the best advertisement in the world. It still stays true is that word of mouth is the best advertisement. So that's how, you know, my name started to trinkle was like after a few people wore some things that were unusual, you know, and they're wearing them out to parties, you know, we could still go to parties and clubs in and mm -hmm. it would be safe. Then that group would tell another group and then so on, so on. And so word of mouth was really how the whole thing caught on. And then I was my best advertiser as well. So I would wear, you know, my own designs and people would ask me where I got them from. So after doing that and then, you know, working a nine to five job that I was never going to get a raise from it because I only did just enough to get by. And I was mm -hmm. too busy at the, at the um, you know, at the bank doing my personal designing and sketching and stealing pens and paper from them so I could go home and sketch some right. more. I was never going to get a raise. I decided to quit and start my own company. So I did not have a business plan. And I don't know people are like, you know, screeching and saying, oh, hold it. Um, you know, educators, like this is how it should right. go. But mine right. was just an unusual path that I took. Um, and since I found myself like, you know, selling so much stuff like out of my home and on the side, then um, I thought the next step is to start, you know, start your own business. And so I had a friend that was like, um, you know, I'll, I'll let's go into business 50 50. I'll help you with it. And it sounded like a great idea to me. And about, you know, 30 days in, he was like, uh, I think I'm going to come out. I don't want to do this, but you got to pay my money back. I'll give you a year to give me the money back. And wow. of course, in between that um, um, year's time, you know, I ended up getting Michael Jordan as a client and the person came back and he was like, oh, well, I was oh, like, wait, oh, no, I well, this is over. <laughs> it's over. The love affair is the love right. affair is over. And so everything has kind of been, you know, flying, flying by the seat of my pants, unfortunately. Um, it was all just, you know, like, you know, just being tenacious and steadfast and um you know when the person said that they were going to pull out and you know and the money that they had in they were going to take out you know, just in my mind I was making secretarial money so it's like how am I going to keep this going you know how am I going to keep on paying my tailors and um and you know just like how am I going to keep it running but you know I just you know, I, I just kept going. I, I just didn't stop. I kept going. And and in the beginning, because I didn't sew and, uh, you know, I didn't have those skills, 
I put an ad in a newspaper and I put an ad in a Polish newspaper. And the reason I went to a Polish newspaper is that in the 80s, there was a huge migration of uh, Polish people coming to America who had incredible tailoring skills. And they were opening up cleaners and doing alterations to begin with. And, um, and I went to a couple of those and I asked people and then I put an ad in the Polish newspaper and I put the ad in Polish because I had one English speaking person who knew how to speak Polish. So I thought I could get a whole group of um, people that had incredible um, tailoring skills. Of course, I looked out to our community, but in that time, in the early 80s, there were not a lot of African-Americans doing high-end tailoring. As a matter of fact, I couldn't find one. I had my doors open for designers to come, and when they come, their work was inferior to the work that I had been putting out and what I was looking for. So I always gave everybody a chance, but I always told them, you got to sharpen your skills and you come back, and I definitely got you. So uh, a lot of the designers in the city have definitely come, you know, come this way to work with me and uh, have gone on you know, to, to work to do some other things. But initially there were Europeans that worked with me to start my business and the crisp, you know, uh, the crisp sewing techniques and the tailoring skills that I didn't have, they were able to teach. What I, something that I thought was interesting as well is the fact that you actually do have a very, um, not uh, obscure is, what, is not the word I want to use, but more so like a um, divergent path to success where like, like you said, you weren't classically trained, you know, um, you, you, you didn't know exactly how to cut and sew yourself at the time. And it, even, you know, you going back and forth with your business partner at that time as well. What would you say for aspiring entrepreneurs, you know, in any industry, would you say one of the most important, one of the most important attributes to try to like, especially when starting off to get past those initial steps that may come and like seem like, oh, how am I going to do this? Or, oh, how do I jump over these initial hurdles, which can sometimes seem like the hardest to overcome when trying to start your own business? Um, well, the, you know, there's like a, there's like a couple of them. So there's, there's so many pitfalls that come your way. And there's so many pitfalls that have definitely, you know, come my way. Like life has definitely come in and, you know, and, and shut me down on some, you know, sometimes when you want to like sit in the corner and like pull your hair out. Mm -hmm. But you, the fear of just like the, the fear of failing and not being able to move on is something that can give you like so much strength. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I have to take it back to, you know, being the teen mom and saying how, you know, everybody in the neighborhood was like, oh, she's not going to graduate. Oh, she'll be pregnant again the next year. It's like sometimes the naysayers can give you such strength. It's the strength to be able to fly, to do whatever you want to do. And I've always just believed in flight. I've always just believed in you don't have to have the regimented things in place that people say you do. You just have to really believe in yourself. And when people see that you believe in yourself, everyone comes out to help you. Whoever, mm -hmm. you know, whoever's around and they see that, you know, you stay late, you know, you work really hard, you, you know, you just put extra time in. People are always watching you when you don't, they don't, they don't watch you. And then when they see you in that crisis or that time of need, then that's when they show up. And, you know, they can make life just a little bit easier for you. So it's really just believing in yourself, just, you know, that that feeling. And I love to use that word innate because I believe that some of us are just like actually born with something in us that tells us even when we're younger and it's not as bright and beautiful that there's something bright and beautiful waiting for you if you just believe in yourself and you really work hard and you put, you know, more than you put more than you think that you have to put into it. And it's just like mm -hmm. digging deep and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps when you want to have that nervous breakdown. Um, you know, kind of going back to touch on, you know, your tena uh, tenaciousness as a business person and um, kind of you doing this um, self-marketing, what would you say was kind of like that stepping stone where you were able to actually solidify um, your credibility as a designer? You know, outside of just people asking you or, or seeing like you on the elevator or things of that nature, like, is there a moment or even if there was a specific job or client where it was like, oh, we got to get Miss Bates on the call. That, that's what we need right now. Like, wh wh where were you or kind of what was that thing that helped you take you to the next level to just, like solidify you? So I won't say that there was something that took me to the next level, but I would say that that moment is a moment like now. It's just saying that, hey, I'm celebrating 35 years. Mm. So while you're doing it, you don't get to say, hey, I'm, I'm here now or, or you know, I'm, I got some stuff in Neiman's. Oh, I'm done. Oh, I just made a sale for 40,000. Oh, I'm, I'm, I've made it. And none of those things are the things that say, hey, you're what it is. It's mm. just you looking back and saying, you know, 
us 35 years later, and, you know, and I'm still relevant. I'm still here. And I believe that I, I don't have as much in front of me as I have behind me, but I still have something in front of me. I know that I still have more to offer. And so for me, that's where it comes. I, I never get to the mark where I say, oh, this is it. Because when you get there, then it's time to retire and to stop. And I'm not ready to do that. So I believe that there's still more and it, it hasn't happened yet. Um, I definitely wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about your uh, foundation. Um, you started that in 1999? Right. I started the foundation in 1999. Yeah. Okay, cool. Can you and, talk uh, to me a little bit about your inspiration on why you did that and kind of some of the work that you do? Okay. So the foundation, uh, so actually like, um, early on in my career, probably like about my, um, my, my second or third year in business after I started the business, I think I got an article in a newspaper that, you know, West side girl designs clothes for uh, Michael Jordan, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I got a phone call from someone who's, you know, want to know, Hey, is, you know, my speech Barbara Bates and I oh, yeah, this is Barbara. Like, oh, I saw the article in the newspaper and I've been following you, uh, you know, following your career. Are you the same Barbara that had a baby in high school? And so I'm like, whoa, where's this going? And she says, well, hold on. The reason I'm asking that is that I actually went to high school with you. And, you know, I remember you and, you know, you probably won't remember me. But right now, today, I work with girls who are teen moms and I would love it if you would come out and you would speak to them. I think you'd be such an inspiration. And um and uh, I, I really didn't, I didn't want to do it because I didn't really, I'm not, it's like, I'm not a speaker. I don't, what could I possibly say about that? Because mm -hmm. at that point, I didn't understand how the two would merge or how they mesh together. And so um, I, I wasn't going to go, but as, as, you know, as the higher one would have at the day that I was supposed to go, the phone rang and the young lady said, I just want to make sure that you're on your way over and you know where to come. So I said, okay, I'm on my way now. So I knew where it was because it was in the area that I grew up in. Um, you know, that I grew up. So I knew exactly where it was, but I had no plan on going. So I did not have anything prepared to say. There was no speech. I didn't know what I was going to say when I got there. So I went and when I went into the room and it was over on, um, it was over on like Coleman and Van Buren, Bethany Hospital was the hospital that was there. And when I went into the room, there were about um, 20 young girls, the youngest 11, the oldest 15, and they were all teen moms. And they were at alternative school and they were there for this program to be inspired. And, um, I stood in front of them and I just start telling my story of, you know, how I grew up right in that same neighborhood. I know that area very well. And I just kind of like, I took them down a very, very personal road of how I felt being a teen mom, how other people made me feel. And I told the story of how, that I had graduated with honors from high school and I graduated in three years. Now, I never had to tell that story, so I never had to think about it. So even though I lived it, it was nothing that I went back to. It was over. It was behind me. But standing in front of them, they like clapped when I said I graduated early. They clapped when I said I graduated with honors. You know, they were like giving me the, you know, giving me these ovations for things that I never thought about. They were things that I did great because there were so much that people told me that I had done wrong. And um, it was an aha moment. And I talked about how... Um, you know, how my grand, how my grandmother, uh, you know, had like, you know, done the praying for us to be blessed the way we are today. And definitely for me. And I would say, and I said something like, and my grandmother was somebody who would, who could never accept a gift. I would always send her gifts. And when I asked her if she liked them, she would say, I gave them to this person or that person. And so I would tell my mom, I'm not going to send her things because she's ungrateful. She's always giving stuff away. And at that moment, <laughs> my grandmother stepped into my body and I stood in front of those young girls sitting out there and I thought I needed to give something away. Mm -hmm. And so I said, if you go back to your high school and you graduate, I'll make your prom dress for you. And that was kind of like the beginning of it. Um, I was able to follow like three girls, went back to their high school, they graduated and then I made their prom dresses for them. And then someone who was there called CPS and said, hey, there's this young woman who graduated from CPS schools. She's got a story to tell, you need to come and get her. So the next week I was at Tesla school and the next week I was at a, another alternative school and I found myself at about 14 schools on the speaker mm -hmm. circuit, you know, telling my personal story that was inspiring other young, young women. And of course, no one in my shop got a raise that year because I had given away so many prom dresses until we were just like, like, we can't, you can't keep doing this. You can't keep giving away these prom dresses. So I asked my friends if they would help me, if they would at least pay for the fabric, then I would pay for the labor and we do the prom dresses. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up getting some publicity from the Tribune newspaper. And once we got the Tribune newspaper publicity, 
And then um, someone sent me a check for like $1,500 and said, wow. you know, I love the work you're doing. You should start, you know, here's $1,500 for dresses, but not for teen girls who are moms, but for girls who are full figured. I was overweight. I couldn't get a beautiful prom dress. Could you put this towards their dresses and you should start a foundation. Right. So then I had to go look up what's the foundation. Right, right. And, and, you know, at that point, um, you know, at that point is when I started the Barbara Bates Foundation. So I started, you know, just like, you know, giving back, not just to girls who were teen moms, but inner city, just kids who needed it. You know, not the kids that were like, you know, the, the A students who were always noticed or who were always seen, but the kids who weren't wearing designers clothes, the kids who were coming to school because they didn't want to be at home. They needed to be in a school to get away from the hell they were going through. And that was the person that I wanted to reach out to. This the person that you could inspire and just give some hope to so that they could see that they were just as special as the people who in our community were, you know, the light or the bright or the long hair, the misconceptions of what beauty is and what what beautiful is in our community. And so the, the foundation um, worked on that premise, you know, for, uh, I mean, I just stopped doing prom dresses maybe, well, I haven't stopped, but the foundation stopped doing prom dresses probably like about two or three years ago when prom became like so incredible that, you know, you had to go get the dragon from Game of Thrones to ride into prom on. <laughs> right, 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 right. The train that went back 15, you know, they wanted like way too much and then it became, it wasn't exciting to me anymore. And so right. I, I said, I think I've done my due. I've given away, you know, over like a thousand suits tuxedos and prom dresses. I've done, you know, my deal with, with prom dresses and the foundation moved on to another phase a part two. And that one had to do with health issues. Awesome. Awesome. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that second phase? Sure. That's yeah, no problem. So uh, actually in 2009, I was diagnosed with um, breast cancer and, you know, to my amazement, I really didn't know much about breast cancer. I thought that mostly white women got breast cancer or women with big breasts got be breast cancer or people who had cancer in their family. So I never thought that I was at risk for breast cancer. I wasn't getting mammograms um, as, you know, as normally as I should have since I didn't think that I was at risk. So it was quite a shock to me when I was told that I had stage three breast cancer and I'd have to undergo a lumpectomy and chemo and radiation. Wow. And, um, and I did for, uh, for like, a, it was like a year's worth of treatment um, uh, with chemo and radiation and then another year of, uh, of, a, of a fluid chemo. And that was in um, 2009, I was diagnosed and I've been cancer free. It's gonna be 12 years, June the 1st. Wow. And, uh, but because I was in such awe of like, how could I have been a breast cancer? You know, how did I get breast cancer? I thought it was important that black women knew how prevalent breast cancer was because once I announced that I had breast cancer, I started getting so many phone calls from people I knew who were like, oh, I had breast cancer four years ago. Oh, I had breast cancer last year. And I was like, God, you guys have been like in my face for years. And you, I never knew that, you know, why didn't you say anything? And some people aren't as, you know, as aren't as transparent as I am. Some people want to keep that close to them. And so I understood that. Right, but I just right, thought right. that it was something that needed to be shouted to the rooftop. Like, do you know how important it is that we all go get mammograms? Do you know that breast cancer is so prevalent that so many African-American women have had it but they haven't wanted to tell that they've had it. So it needs to be like shouted from the rooftops. So I decided that um, since it landed on my doorstep that I would advocate for it and definitely in the African-American African -American and Latino community. And so I decided to, um, to give a fashion show and all the models would be breast cancer survivors and we would raise money for an inner city hospital. I actually started this um, venture with Northwestern Hospital because that's where my treatment was. But, um, the $50,000 that we raised, I asked it to go to an inner city hospital. And I picked a hospital that was near where I lived that I swore I'd never go to if I ever got sick. I was like, don't take me there. You know how we feel about our hospitals that sit in our neighborhoods. But I got mm -hmm. research and I learned more about it and I visited. And that hospital was Mount Sinai Hospital that you know has been around over 100 years. Um, served a, a large Jewish community back in the day and they could easily have closed and went on, but they stayed in the community and they're a thriving uh, hospital right now. And, um, and so I decided that the money should go to their uh, breast cancer division. They have a, a, uh, something called Helping Her Live and they go out into the community and they bring women in and they make them uh, you know, get mammograms. And so after I raised the 50,000, it was the first time I had ever raised $50,000. It was like a million dollars as far as I was concerned. I had right. to my eyes you know, when I got to the bank and got the cashier's check to give them. Um, the 
president of the bank at that time, I mean, at the hospital called and said, you know, we really appreciate the money and uh, I'd like to know if I can make a deal with you. If you could raise a half a million in five years, then we'd like to name a breast imaging center after you. So after wow. I cursed him out and hung up the phone on him, then he called me back like, <laughs> and he was like, I think we got disconnected. <laughs> and oh no, I hung up on you. <laughs> <laughs> then when he called back, he said, you know, um, I was like, uh, you know, it's like I said, raising the 50 was like paying a bill to me. I was like, it's I don't I don't it's really hard work. I don't think I want to do that. And um, when he said, well, you know, uh, first of all, I have something that I'd like to show you. Could you meet me over at Northwestern? And so the guy, the president of Sinai took me over to Northwestern and they had new chemotherapy rooms in Northwestern. And one of them had the name on the plaque was uh, Barbara Bates image uh, Barbara Bates foundation. So we had a room that was dedicated to us for the money that we raised. And he's like, we'd like to do that over at Sinai. And so, you know, he courted me for a few right, months. Right, then, right. I, yeah, then, I, then I finally broke down and I, and I ended up saying yes. So we did the fashion show a couple of years. Um, we stood on the corners out in front of Sinai and we collected money from people. We waitressed at bars and hotels. We did a breast wow. cancer walk. And, you know, after like four years, we raised $640,000. And so uh, actually the imaging center, the, um, the naming will be in a couple of months because of COVID and another building having asbestos. We're finally to the point this year where we're gonna do the naming of the breast imaging center. And it will have the very first 3D breast imaging machine um, that's wow. signed, you know, from Sinai. And that's from the money that we raised from the foundation. So, so that's what happened on that end. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, first and foremost, you know, congratulations to you and, and uh, on your health and everything and bless that you're able to be here today and um, that your foundation has been doing great work. Um, uh, funny enough, uh, going back a little bit to um, the Barbara Bates giving away the dresses and everything like that, that aspect of the, um, of the foundation, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but Oh, Black Muse is actually affiliated with Chicago West Community Music Center, um, which was started in 1999 uh, by Howard Sandifer and Darlene Sandifer. Um, and this was basically uh, during the time that, you know, the music and art programs back in the day uh, in around 1979, uh, you know, there was this mentoring of, of, the, of the arts and, um, you know, the music programs in the schools. So uh, you actually, one of the students uh, that was in the Chicago West program received one of your dresses during that time. And that was actually the first time that I, I met you. So I was Oh way my younger, goodness. You know, yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I was one of the students in that session that was able to receive um, one of your dresses. And that was kind of the first time I had ever, you know, heard of your foundation, heard of your name and uh, seen some of your work. So, you know, I just want to thank you again. It's been an honor again to kind of you know, oh wow, that's back amazing! Into, yeah, um, and you know, and, and a lot and, and a lot happened from that day. Um, the young lady <laughs> India that received the prom yeah. dress. I remember she stood up and she said, "Miss Barbara Bates, would you make me a prom dress?" And everybody thought it was so funny, and they laughed yep. at her. Yep. And yep. then I told her, "Yeah, you can get a prom dress," and she was over there crying. And then yep. from that, we get uh, a documentary. <laughs> so that was uh, that was quite amazing. That was that was yeah. amazing. Yeah. And I have so a wonderful video that you guys sent me as well that I still have. Awesome. I was just going to ask you. I was just going to ask oh about that video. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to yeah, pull so, it out when I go home. <laughs> you have to. You have to. Definitely, definitely. So, that's, so just wanted to bring that up to say that I, I can attest firsthand that, you know, your foundation has done great work in the community. And um, like I said, you, you're always looking out to help and give back. And, you know, that's what we love. Um, go in a little bit further into like, you know, uh, more of your work, um, you know, in the recent times and things of that nature, I noticed that obviously as some, as we kind of touched on a little bit um, earlier, you know, your catalog of clientele is, uh, you know, enormous and you have worked with a lot of great people. Do you have any like interesting stories or is there like a favorite person that you worked with? Like, or maybe some, something juicy, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so one of my juicy stories, I don't know if it's a favorite story, one of my juicy stories is Whitney Houston, all-time favorite, mm. love, 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 mm. Whitney Houston. And Can't I wait. had the opportunity, <laughs> I had the opportunity to, um, to meet her um, and take her measurements for some clothes. So, if, so a friend of mine was in LA 
and he was in a hair salon and he had my clothes that he was showing around to people. And mm -hmm. Whitney's then partner um, said, oh, Whitney would love, Whitney would love this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. took him up to the hills to where she was and she picked out you know all kind of you know all kind of like clothing from it right and so then i had the opportunity she came to chicago and i had the opportunity to meet her so i had to go to the hotel room where she was at and i was like i mean i didn't i was just in awe and so i went to the hotel room and we went into the bathroom so i could take her get good measurements on her right. take her measurements and when she raised up her arm for me to take her measurements she had an afro underneath her arms like she'd never shaved ever in life and i thought oh my gosh Whitney houston doesn't shave her underarms yeah, she's a busy lady you know what i mean she's moving around different two days. You know what I'm, saying? I'm sure they get it right right before the show oh, yeah. no 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 it wasn't one of those type it wasn't one, it wasn't it wasn't one of those type where i just didn't shave in a week it was like i've never <laughs> shaved ever in life i don't believe in that and so okay. like, okay, cool. Whitney doesn't change she's kind of like the europeans but, uh, right that, right like, right because and, and and the talker that i am i couldn't say i couldn't even ask her i couldn't say anything i i was just like stuck stunned I, <laughs> I was like so starstruck i couldn't say a thing and i think i said something really stupid like oh oh i think you're so wonderful or something like that and she says no you're wonderful with these great designs i was like oh lady let me have my moment <laughs> Yeah, so that was one. That's, awesome. <laughs> That's cool. And I'm sure you have many more. Um, but uh, real quick, I do want to, I don't want to keep you, I know you've got a busy schedule, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've done recently and uh, anything upcoming that you have going on. Um, I know, if correct me if I'm wrong, October 2019, you did the uh, Real Woman Wear Bates um, fashion show. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and like how that went? Okay, so um, yeah, 2019, we did Real Women Wear Bates Fashion Show where I didn't use models from agencies, but I actually used just real women from the street. You know, they were all sizes, all ages, all colors. And uh, I was just showing that, you know, no matter who you are, that I can give you clothing that could represent, you know, you and your body and make you feel, you know, like a supermodel. And so those shows were not actually fundraiser shows, although we gave you know, like some funds, they were actually Barbara Bates fashion shows to just show the brand. This is what right, I do. Right, of course, this, is, yeah. this is what I'm doing now. And so the fashion show, uh, we didn't do last year, of course, because of COVID. But right, this right. year with my 35th year anniversary, the show will take place October the 3rd. And okay. uh, the venue uh, is a West Side venue, and the name won't come to me like just uh, just right now. But it's a West Side venue, October third. And so that's Great. where the 35th year anniversary will be. But we're going to start like, you know, just shooting out all kind of messages for people to save the date and to come celebrate, you know, 35 years with us. And we'll uh, we'll do we'll do a little bit of everything for this fashion show. We're going to throw in men's fashions. We'll throw do use awesome. our supermodels. We'll use our real women but it'll just encompass all of what my 35 years um, in designing has done. And so if people are interested in this and you know, want to find out more information, can they just go directly to your website? Uh, actually, it's not up on the website, yes, but yes, by the time uh, it will be on the website, we will do some uh, something on the website at, at Barber Base Designs for sure, yeah. Okay. And then, and other, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. And then other than that, next Saturday, I have a four week class Bates, the Bates Fashion Lab, correct? Right, it's the Bates Fashion awesome. Lab. And it'll be held, um, it's gonna be, it's gonna start on May the 15th, it's a Saturday, and it'll be for four Saturdays. And we're doing that Saturday mornings for an hour and a half. I've um, got about 25 students that are, or students and young adults from the West Side that are interested in some capacity in working in the fashion industry. You know, we'll teach business tips, um, etiquette tips, finance tips, just everything will go through the eyes of, uh, of, of what I've done in fashion that can relate to what they want to do in life. And we're going to offer some internships. We're going to offer some really cool things to people who show up and participate and, uh, and try to make the class uh, something that they can take, have some takeaways from it that they can take into life. Awesome. And so for, awesome. so for that, I think the class is full. We may have about three spaces that are left and they can just like call our studio. We'll make it happen for them if they want to go, but they have to be West Siders. Awesome. That yeah, love that. And of course, <laughs> um, you know, we're gonna make sure we have uh all that information, you know, on our website. So, you oh. know, people see the video, see the link, they'll have that information. Um, and then you know, obviously you, you'll have it on your personal website as well. Um, is there anything like top of mind that you kind of want to make us privy to or that we didn't get 
to get to touch and that you want to kind of talk about? No, I think you're an amazing interviewer. And uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you on the big screen really soon if you're not already on there. Yeah. Uh, so me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's your destined. You're destined for sure. I appreciate it. Hey, maybe I can come help you out in uh, one of your shows or something, you know, give you my model face. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a done deal already. It's a done deal. <laughs> Shoot. Let's get it. Well, hey, um, I, I just want to say thank you so much, so much for coming on the show and allowing me to take your time to bend your ear about some of the things that you've done and just, you know, your thoughts on, you know, the industry as a whole. Um, you know, again, we want to take a special thanks out for Chicago West Community Music Center. Um, you know, obviously, as you know, you know, the arts is very, very important, um, especially for our youth. And that's something that we want to make sure we push to the forefront and make sure it's, you know, it's very important to all of our consumers and our listeners. Um, we do ask that, you know, uh, if you want to learn more about Chicago West Community Music Center or um, any of the organizations that Ms. Bates has going on, um, please visit our websites. Our website will be at cwcmc.org. Again, that is cwcmc.org. And, um, you know, again, thank you to all the viewers and listeners. And um, remember, if you like what you see, like what you heard, like these discussions, please, please, please comment, like, repost below. And once again, my name is David Houston. This is Ms. Barbara Bates. And uh, this has been Black Muse. Thank you so much again for being on the show. It's my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>